So Nationwide Marketing Group going virtual this year. It's a big announcement. It's a big deal. It's a big change. October 27th through the 29th, though, it's going to happen. It's free for all Nationwide members. So go to nationwideprimetime.com. Get the details. Get signed up. I mean, here's what I was talking to Whitaker. Mike Whitaker. Mike Whitaker. The Mike Whitaker. There are still yeah. going to be lots of surprises. So just because it's a virtual conference doesn't mean it's going to be like, hey, how you doing? I'm talking to you. I'm giving a speech and you're done. No, there are going to be surprises along the way. So tuning in live is going to be a key piece of this. So is one of those surprises him wearing a purple dress? That, that's already been done. Oh, well then. That already happened. What's the point? During our speech. So last comment for you. If you're listening to this and you're thinking about Nationwide, consider this. The trip is free, right? So the, the, the event itself, you don't have to pay for. But um, the trip is really free because the stuff that you learn while you're there one idea, Kinsley, and it pays for everything because you will pick up that much information. So check them out. Nationwide primetime event in October. 27th is my sister's birthday. I think they moved it just for that. Happy birthday, Carrie. We're joined on the show today by Mr. Charlie Maloof. Mr. Charlie. Mr. Charlie Maloof. Mm. So the CEO of Broad River Retail, 24 Ashley stores. Now, is that all over the North Carolina area or like what's your, your geography? You go straight there. Yeah, I don't even get to say hello. Right? Uh, no, no. Hey, Tell us that and then we'll backtrack. Well, and why is your name Charlie? And why did you name the stores Ashley if your name is Charlie? That's what I want to get to the bottom of right away. Let's get straight there. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a great, it's great. This, let me tell you, this is my first ever mattress podcast. Ooh. This is my first ever mattress podcast, so wow. it's awesome to be here. Um, let's figure out what you, what's up, Mark Quinn and Mark Kinsley. We'll just go with Q and K or Quinn and Kinsley. That's good. Uh, We've been called worse. Really I, I'm not really sure, but um, it's a pleasure to be on the Dose Marcos podcast. Um, we're, all of our stores are in uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, and we, we dip into Georgia uh, with our Augusta store. So we came across you. So we saw you at the Furniture Today betting conference and did a great job interacting with some of the other people in our industry. And I just really enjoyed seeing uh, that group of people come together, even though it was virtual. And then we had Dr. V on the podcast mm -hmm. and Dr. V of course, with Miskelly's and central Mississippi, and you can go back and listen to that episode, but he said, you're one of his favorite people and you should really be on the Dos Marcos podcast. And so we got connected with you and that's a, that's a glowing endorsement. How do you know Dr. V? Well, I would say the same about Dr. V that you just said that, that, that I would say he's one of my favorite people. I love to know Dr. V is to love Dr. V and I will defend him if anyone says a, a word again, uh, otherwise. But uh, Dr. V, the way I like to explain it, taught me everything I know about selling white boxes, about selling <laughs> mattresses. And, um, you know, I'm Miss Kelly's, I, I'm very familiar with them because um, for a couple reasons. I'm from Jackson, Mississippi. So I'm from central Mississippi. They're obviously very well known there. I grew up born and raised there. Shout out to J-Town. And uh, Dr. V, um, my uh, original business partner, how I got into the furniture industry uh, was um, a nephew to the Miskelly brothers. So Jonathan Ishi, his uncles are the Miskellys. And, and so um, Oscar and Tommy and Chip, and, and I, I probably stay a lot more in touch with Oscar and Tommy these days. Um, and, but Jonathan, uh, and, and we'd go on site visits to learn from them, and they'd come see us to learn from us. And so we, we grew up sharing best practices with their company and their organization for, for many, many years and still stay in touch. And so, um, I, I, you know, we, we've actually had Dr. V uh, to one of our events. Um, uh, we really took it up an, uh, a notch last year for our original Purpose 828 Summit. Um, I had heard a, a podcast interview that Dr. V did with uh, Bill McLaughlin on the science of selling sleep with purpose. Um, or maybe that's the title we use, but he, he did a, uh, an interview, uh, I think it was at the 2019 betting conference with, um, with uh, Bill McLaughlin, and just, I loved it. I mean, I, I listened to that uh, podcast uh, a few times. I shared it with our people, and I said, we've got, I've got to get him to our organization, and so when we did a, um, our Purpose 828 event and uh, synced up with our leadership summit last year, about a year ago today, um, we brought him in and four folks from Miskelly's and he presented for like 90 minutes to our people on the science of selling sleep 
with purpose and going all in and then sharing a lot of their ideas. So he's, um, he's an incredibly smart guy in the mattress industry and uh, very well respected. And, um, and I love him to that. I actually just had a conversation with him this morning because I had a new retail account and this retailer was trying to figure out sanitization and process. And I just went to school this morning with Dr. V. I have like pages upon pages of notes and he was just like very, he's a very giving guy and he's very knowledgeable and it's just a fun person to be around on top of that. Absolutely. He's, he, he, he has a plethora of knowledge that he openly and willingly shares. And so if you, you know, if you got a curious mind and, and you're open to learning, I mean, he's, he's a great teacher. Um, so I, I think, you know, I've learned a lot from him in, in all truth, truthfulness and seriousness. Um, you know, even in terms of like how to um, position lighting in a mattress gallery so it doesn't get in the, the guests' eyes when they lay down, you know, just or the type size of mattress that you might want to have in the mattress gallery based off of the type of mattress it is. I mean, just going down to the, that root level, like I'm going back, you know, 12, 14 years of, of just tips and strategies that he that he taught us and taught me that we deployed and worked and worked to our advantage to boost our sales. So, so Charlie, you, you've, you've built a heck of a company there. And when you got there, um, you were not the majority owner. You had bought an interest in that. Can you tell us a little bit about how that started for you and, and, and then continue it on to where you just, you know, where you are today or like what, what was it that allowed you to get where you are today? Because the, the path to get there had to be riddled with challenges and frustration and doubt, maybe even. Can you just tell us a little bit about when you first got there and your journey to this point? Yeah, I got, I got into furniture the way most people do uh, via technology in Mississippi. Um, that's my joke. My, 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 <laughs> I'm waiting, I'm waiting, Mark, to see your reaction. Well, we were waiting to make sure it was okay to laugh. I wasn't <laughs> sure. So, uh, uh, so I, I um, uh, it's, it's a really interesting story. And um, I'll even go back to, I mean, I knew Jonathan Ishii uh, because he worked for an advertising agency in uh, Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, and I had a, um, a technology company that was doing like e-business. We were an e-business shop. So whether you need search engine marketing, online marketing, website development, um, email marketing, or, or e-commerce, um, you know, we did it all in, in the state of Mississippi um, for, for customers. And we partnered with a lot of advertising agencies because they may have had the clients and the clients who had the need, but they um, did a lot of the graphical work and not kind of the programming under the hood. So we, we hired a lot of programmers from the University of Mississippi, from Ole Miss at that time. And we put up a, a development shop in Oxford. And then our, our sales office was in Jackson. And so we really just sold throughout um, the, the Mid-South, if you will. But we partnered with a lot of advertising agencies because they would bring us in for their, like, the, the, the uh, under the hood programming work, if you will, to help the, and this, this goes back, um, you know, many, many years ago, but Jonathan worked for an advertising agency. We were doing pro a lot of projects together. We got to know each other and we, we kind of always talked about, Hey, wouldn't it be cool for two kids, you know, um, uh, in Mississippi to kind of start a business together. I remember he tried to get his advertising agency. He tried to broker a deal then to get them to acquire my, my web development shop and spin us off because he worked in the interactive department of his agency. I think they just kind of appeased him with a meeting that didn't really go anywhere. But he ended up going to Vanderbilt to get his MBA degree. And we just stayed in touch through his uh, uh, that um, he, he couldn't. Um, I'll give you a little bit about his story because it goes into the founding of our company. Um, he couldn't get uh, uh, an interview like his uh, co classmates uh, in, at Vanderbilt with the investment banks at the time. Um, and so they were getting these great uh, plush job offers, you know, coming out of grad school. Well, he didn't have enough experience because he went to Vanderbilt at a young age uh, with a little bit limited experience relative to the typical um, uh, MBA student. And so um, he, his uncles said, well, hey, you ought to talk to the guys at Ashley Furniture. They're starting up this home store concept. And at the time, Jonathan had sold furniture at Miskelly's and he really liked selling Ashley. He thought it was kind of an easy brand to sell. Um, it connected with the guest, the customer. They, they kind of got the value 
proposition. So um, they, you know, Oscar and Chip said, hey, we're not going to give you any money, but we'll help you make a connection. And so one, uh, so he went back to Vanderbilt, got a buddy of his, and they, they wanted to start a business together. They looked in the Southeast, they kind of looked at Birmingham, Raleigh, Charlotte, they settled on the Charlotte market. Some way, somehow, they kind of uh, uh, convinced Ashley to give them the rights to the Charlotte market, even though these were two like 20 something year old kids who had no business experience, but they you know, believed that the Miskellis would kind of be heavily involved and at least that's what they told them. So they got the rights to the market. So Jonathan and I stayed in touch. I came in like new, November, 2003. And he, he, I remember him telling me at that time, Hey, I think I'm on something big here. Uh, I, I'm on the ground floor of what, you know, the next McDonald's is he would ex- explain it to me. Uh, but he was really proud of that, that, that store and like every square foot matters and, you know, and all about the whole science of retail and a lot, a lot of stuff that like Oscar was like teaching him at that time. And so, um, you know, but they had a lot of first year struggles, you know, like all businesses have struggles and, um, you know, th- but their business plan called for them to open up a second store. Uh, so they got through their first year struggles. They survived it. They opened up a second store for the economies of scale in the, uh, in the North part of Charlotte. And, and then that thing they saw was getting to be a little bit too big and they had an opportunity to acquire a store in Greenville, South Carolina. And so that's when Jonathan started kind of reaching out to me. And I said, well, I don't know. This was uh, the end of 2004, beginning of 2005. I said, I don't even know anything about furniture. I'm in in the technology business and I love it. And I've got, I've had my business now for five years and and like, it's been a long haul, but finally it's starting to, we, we just signed some big contracts, a couple quarter million dollar contracts with some big universities and construction companies. Like I'm good, man. I, I, but, but, you know, he kept, he kept kind of reaching out and um, I came to visit them um, and he put an offer in front of me to buy in as an owner. And, it, it, you know, um, for me, it was as much a spiritual calling as it was a business calling, but it was a good business deal. And, um, you know, I had taken some risk, borrowed some, a little bit of money from my mom and my dad and my brother at the time. And I wanted to kind of de-risk my personal situation and, and pay them back. So, um, you know, and, and it was a good enough deal to get in with these guys. So um, literally I sold my company, I sold my house, I sold everything I owned. I even broke up with the girlfriend I had at the time. I left uh, a place that I knew and I knew kind of everyone there and had an industry I knew. And, uh, and this was, uh, and I started with Jonathan and Jackson, May 1, 2005. Um, uh, and, and, you know, I, I, the biggest joke uh, that, that I would say in my life that uh, the man upstairs has on me is I hated shopping growing up. Like I literally hated shopping. I just wanted to play sports or video games or whatever. And, uh, but the fact that I'm in retail and I love it and I, you know, found a passion in, in, in this industry, um, I think is that you can find a passion in really any industry. And so, um, so I joined uh, the day that we acquired the Greenville, South Carolina store on May 1, 2005, as our managing partner and chief operating officer. And um, I, I'll just continue just for a bit. Uh, then Jackson had a kind of a five-year plan. And so he was a couple years, two or three years into that. So eventually after five years, he wanted to move back home. So Jonathan and I bought him out, um, you, you know, um, right, right around the start of the Great Recession. So I don't know, his timing was really good and ours wasn't as good, but that's, that's kind of how I um, got into it, I guess. Okay, so you really kicked off things. You said May 1st, 2005, hit the ground running, ran into the recession. Fast forward, we're in 2020, but hit us with some of, you know, the key kind of turning points for the business or some of your favorite memories that pepper that path between 05 and, and right here in 2020. Yeah, there's, there's been quite a few. Um, so, um, so, uh, you know, we, we, um, well, the great recession was one. I remember in 2008 or nine, whatever it was, the, our, our phrase was all about how do we make our runway longer? And so how do we cut back expenses? I mean, we did some really goofy stuff that I would not advise. I mean, we tried to have a single manager cover two stores or three stores. Like I, I don't, we were just trying to cut, we, we, we didn't think that we could raise top line and literally on a per store basis, top line got cut in half overnight. So for us, it was like, what, what can we do to um, extend our runway? And I will tell you like what really saved us in 09 was um, 
growing into new markets. Like our bank right then was, and even Jonathan at the time didn't want to grow because the banks were saying, hey, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Hold on to what you got. Yeah, I mean, it was pretty scary at the time, especially for big ticket items when, hey, a lot of our customers who had like open to buy accounts, they didn't have any more access to credit. Like they were, they reduced all their accounts and, you know, and then we couldn't get anyone approved. And what we realized was from 03 to 07, it was really just an artificial bubble. That wasn't reality. And so now here we are with, with not even reality, sub reality, all, all, but we just have to kind of gut it, gut it through. But, um, the most inflexible cost at retail is, is your occup occupancy cost, right? Your rent. And so we went into new markets where finally as a retailer, we had leverage and, and, the, and the landlords had all the leverage from 03 to 07, but now we could sign deals that could um, dollar cost average down our occupancy cost without cannibalizing our, our current revenues. So that's how we went into Columbia, South Carolina. That's how we went into Augusta, Georgia. That's how we went into Hickory, North Carolina. And ultimately that's how we went east to Raleigh, Durham, Fayetteville through a strategy that was from 09 through 15, which was growth that added to the stability of our company to protect all our, the lives and families who depended on the company. That's what, how and why we grew through that time uh, was really through that, or maybe 09 through 13 or 14 was how we looked at it. Um, Cause we were actually not named Broad River Retail. We were named a couple different operating companies. And when we crossed over the Broad River, um, Jonathan really liked that connotation of a, a slow and steady, constantly moving river. And so that's kind of how we rebranded our corporate image initially is Broad River Furniture. And then there's a story about how we put the word replaced furniture with retail uh, a couple years ago. So that was, that'd be one story about making our runway longer. And then I would say in 2015, we had another kind of a event that almost took us under. Um, we we um, broke all of our bones in the first half of 2015. We were a proud, pretty proud company, above average company, I would say, uh, up until that time, you know, slow and steady growth. And we had done an ERP conversion and uh, we were ill prepared for it, um, both on people and process. And, um, and so it, it did not go well. We were completely off the rails and we lost uh, a lot of money in the first six months of 2015. We were also building our new campus around that time that was a capital intensive project. And so through a confluence of events, we found ourselves in a very dark spot uh, by, by middle of 2015. And, um, and uh, that, that's actually when I took over the president and CEO role was, was the end of June, beginning of July, 2015. And so I kind of had this idea of, well, when, when presidents come in office, they talk about what they got done in their first 100 days. And so um, I, I knew we needed to get some momentum, generate some momentum, because we had people who were tired, who, who lost a lot of money. We, we, we were in a world of hurt. Um, and I knew about like this concept of 90 day challenges. So we came up with this concept of a 100 day challenge. We called it our bold reset. And we just kind of changed the paint. We changed everything all at once. Uh, got different people off the bus, different people onto the bus, changed titles. And we had just had this period of creative freedom to re really reset, recalibrate. And that really kind of helped pull us out of the muck and uh, return, return and restore to profitability. Um, you know, and then I would say in 2018, you, you, you know, I think uh, after a long time uh, of being uh, great business partners together, Jonathan was ready to move on to another chapter in his life. And we had kind of stabilized the business and, and continued to grow the business. And um, we brought on a couple other operating partners at that time. And so um, we just kind of said, I think it's time for us to, um, we, we, we don't want to stop the journey that we're on. And so um, we worked out an agreement um, with Jonathan. And I think it was a pretty amicable deal to, uh, for me and uh, Manny Rodriguez and Charlie Workman to buy 100% uh, of the company from uh, you know, Jonathan at that time. So, um, so that was June, 2018. So those were a few events, I guess there. Sure, and actually, sure. I'm doing what I didn't want to do. I'm getting long, long in the tooth. I'm sorry. I will try to get shorter, more terse answers. Yeah. No, uh, no, this is, this is great <clears throat> because we want people to hear some of the stories behind the stories and understand, like you said, in 2015, you know, you had a period of time where you're looking in the mirror and having to probably make some really tough decisions. And, and some painful ones. 
Well, I, I, I'm gonna um, not go into too many details, but um, it felt like for about 11 months, we woke up with a, uh, a gun pointed at us. And so we had to learn to, regardless of that, control what we could control, put a smile on our face and get through it. And so, um, and we did, we survived. We, we maintained our, we learned about grit, resilience and, and belief. And, and uh, it was a, it's a beautiful turnaround story from where we were, because we almost got folded up or went away. And, and you know, the bankers and the smart money would have said that we didn't deserve to stick around. And we're very proud of that turnaround time of our history. One thing about your story that I love, Charlie, is that at a time, and you remember back in 2008, I mean, it was dire. I mean, it was a big deal. And I remember the gravity of that and the emotion of that. But yet in light of that, you lean into your business, go to the banks, and put even more risk on yourself and pressure on yourself and decide to expand when everyone else is contracting. But then I've also heard that even during the COVID time, when people were trying to just figure out whether or not they were going to get out on the other side of it, you decided to start buying and filling up warehouses. And nobody is, it's so I think I have that right. And, and nobody was probably doing that because everyone was probably trying to figure out how they were going to look on the other side. What is it about those two examples? Like where you just kind of feel like when the market maybe is going one way, you decide you have to go, what, what inspires you to make those types of decisions? Yeah, I, I love this topic. I, 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 um, I, I'm going to have fun answering this question for you. Um, first of all, I think you have to have a point of view. And I think, I think a point of view um, is going to get tested over time. And I don't think a point of view is something that you can be willy nilly. It's got to be, it's got to be, it's got to simmer. It's got to be a crock pot. It's got to have developed over a long period of time and a lot of inputs and experiences. But once you get a point of view, um, you know, believe in your point of view. Don't let the, the way the wind blows change your point of view. So one of our points of view is the power of people, the power of retail, the power of our business model. Um, and so, yeah, you know, there's a quote from, I really like this quote from Bill Gross. Um, he, he's a really famous uh, venture capital and investor. And, and so it goes a little bit like this. I, I may butcher it, I'll try not to. Um, if you can take a contrarian view and, and be right, that, that, that can have your, um, biggest payoff, your biggest return on investment. And so, um, you know, if people think the world, like, you, you know, but, but you, you cannot be right, right? So that's the, that's the risk. And so you just have to also understand um, the risk you're willing to take. And, you know, from the outside in, I mean, I guess risk is a matter of perspective, but also you got to know your numbers and you got to understand, um, are you, are you truly like taking a risk? Sometimes the risk is in action and not going forward. Like look at Jeff Bezos. I mean, how much of a risk taker is he? But I bet if you look at their financials and understand how they look at the business, he, 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 he probably understands that risk better than most. And so we don't believe that any of our risks are, have, are going to put us in jeopardy of, of, of hurting the mothership, but some of the risk, if we don't take them, um, could. And so I guess it's just uh, a, a different perspective or vantage point of risk per se. But like it with regards to um, COVID, you know, we were opening up a second distribution center. Um, and um, so it was an opportune time to um, bring in inventory. It was either going to work or not work. So we did continue to load up and get to our, uh, I'm glad we did because that, that helped us have a really successful second quarter when we thought it was going to be um, break even at best and we were prepared to lose millions of dollars in, in set the second quarter. It actually was our most profitable quarter we've ever had. And had we not made those investments in inventory, um, we, <laughs> it was like, um, okay, are you sure? Uh, but if we hadn't done it, it, it wouldn't have worked out that way. But also we're long-term, like if, and also it's, it's a matter of what's your, um, what is your outlook? And is it a quarterly, quarterly outlook or a quarter century outlook? So we're willing to take a really long-term outlook. That's why we bought the business. And so over a long period of time, you know, we, we just believe in the power of retail, especially in our industry. Now, if, I, if we um, were selling, uh, you know, uh, um, 
compact discs or something. Maybe, maybe that wouldn't be the right strategy to have. Um, but we believe in the power of retail for what we're doing. And so um, and we understand like, the replacement costs in some of these properties. And, and, um, and, and we, we've also got a lot of replacing a lot of small bets, if you will. And not all of them are going to work out. We've got a litany of failures along the way, but um, you can learn from those bets. And then you, 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 and then the ones that work out, you keep pouring gasoline on them and they keep kind of blowing up for you. So we got uh, a multitude of simultaneous small bets being placed at any given time. But our point of view is our strategy to, towards growth. And we do like, uh, uh, we believe that healthy organizations, healthy people grow. And we, we think that growth is energizing. And so, um, but we want to grow not just on the top line, not just for growth sake. We want to grow on the bottom line too. I mean, I think a good a good goal to have is to have double digit um, uh, uh, top line and bottom line growth compounded annually year over year, and we've been able to achieve that. Did Charlie just make a comparison with compact discs? Is that what he said? <laughs> compact discs and compound growth. <laughs> Come on, Charlie, of all the products you could have brought to us in that moment of that great explanation, you pick compact discs. What should I have gone with? I can't, I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> and, and by the way, you might what have just done with? a lot of people a favor because I think if you would have said CD, <laughs> yeah. some people would be like, what, what does the CD, CD stand yeah. for again? I don't even I know. I'll tell you a funny story. One time uh, uh, a while back, I was, at, I was at home for a holiday or whatever, this many years ago, and I was just not thinking. So I was watching a movie with like my brother and sister and the movie was over and I said, all right, we'll rewind it. And they just all looked at me real funny. They said, it's a DVD. What are you talking about? So, what are you a hundred? <laughs> yeah. Right. I was, like, I was thinking rewind it. We got to take it back to the video store. <laughs> <laughs> Be kind. Please rewind. There you go. Hey, so we're, <laughs> we're talking with Charlie Maloof, CEO of Broad River Retail. Charlie, you mentioned this early on and we kind of skimmed over it, but I want you to tell us about Purpose 828. What is that and what goes on? Yeah, um, well, uh, I, I have to give you a couple little elements of backstory. So um, I'll, I'll limit it. We believe in a word of the year or a theme of the year. So we've, some of our words of the year have been belief, grit, impact. During 2017, which was our word was impact, we actually won, actually won the National Impact Award, which was pretty cool from uh, Furniture Today um, uh, at the time. Um, and then uh, Premier, you know, which pegs to our vision statement to be the premier Ashley Home Store operator. Um, and then uh, you know, last year, our word of the year was purpose. And so um, the other kind of little backstory is we've had leadership summits. Um, and, you know, we think that companies that invest in leadership and their leaders, they, they, uh, data will say that they uh, outperform uh, their competitors uh, by up to 13 times in key performance indicators and in, uh, in other financial metrics. And so we always want to invest in our leaders. And so we've had leadership summits in the past. And so during our year of purpose, uh, we use the time that we would have normally assigned to our uh, leadership summit to be a purpose summit. And uh, we were, you know, I thought it would just be called purpose summit. And then, uh, you know, we had a purpose activation committee during that whole year. Or, and we actually started it a few months before, but we, so we had a purpose activation committee. So we were trying to activate purpose. We had a four pronged approach and one of the uh, phase four was activation. So we want to hold ourselves accountable to what we say, not just be words, but be words we put into action. And so we had our PAC, PAC, but they didn't like the word purpose summit. So we're trying to come up with a, a different name uh, uh, for it. And um, literally um, uh, I was in church and uh, one, one of the uh, uh, verses they talked about was Romans 8, 28. And it just so happened that our purpose summit was going to be on August 28th. And so um, we, we uh, were inspired or I was inspired by uh, Romans 8, 28 and the fact that it was on August 28th. And so we called it purpose 8, 28 was the name of our purpose summit. Very cool. And so when you get together for Purpose Summit, um, what happens to your people? Because I, you know, one of the things I picked up on from the very first email that we exchanged was there is a deep sense of purpose rippling through your organization. And, and I know that because you had a video at the bottom of your email signature. And the video was your people on camera talking about the purpose behind what you do. 
and making it forefront. So talk about that culture that you've created and, and what that means to you and what it means to your people. Yeah, and I, I just realized I also didn't answer your question exactly about what Purpose 828 was. We had a bunch of purpose uh, speakers who we've been reading and following and we brought them in to invest in our people. Um, uh, I want to go back just to, just a hair. So um, in, in 2015, we changed from a human resources department to a human capital department. And it was really uh, because um, not to see people as money or, or anything like that, but to see people as assets as opposed to liabilities. Like a resource is a liability on the balance sheet. You want to minimize it. Um, a, a capital is, is an asset that you want to grow. And so we don't even have like the acronym RSA. I hate the acronym RSA, which I know is an industry standard. I also hate the term betting to refer to our category. I uh, prefer sleep. But, um, but it bothered me that um, uh, retail sales associate, RSA, that the person who had been there nine years and the person who had been there nine days or nine hours, just because the person had been there nine years, um, they get the same title as the person who had been there nine days, nine hours, just because they had selected this profession, the, the art of, and science of sales, which is like one of the most important professions in our in business and commerce, they, they, they have stasis, they can't grow. And so it just didn't make sense. And so we held ourselves accountable to having um, uh, uh, career paths at ev in, in every category, every department, even on the sales floor where you wouldn't traditionally see it. And so, um, and then, so we have home furnishings associates, home furnishings consultants, home furnishings professionals, home furnishings experts. And there's different like bonus levels, pay scales, uh, rewards, incentives, and they're earned both through um, performance and through certifications. And so now you can continue to grow. So we always want to have kind of personal growth and, and organizational growth, right? And so, uh, and that goes back to like these summits and investing in our people. When we launched our purpose um, statement, um, we had done a workout as a leadership team and couldn't couldn't come to a consensus. And so we launched a vision statement instead because we had mission and values or mission and principles, if you will, mission and core values. We launched a vision statement instead and we put the purpose uh, work on hold. And then I read a book called The Story of Purpose by Joey Ryman and I started following him and kind of understood his approach and um, came up with this, this statement that was kind of synthesizing all the work that our, our executive leadership team had, had worked on, but, um, but didn't tell anyone because we just kind of like pressed pause on it and done our vision statement. And so I let it marinate for 11 months because I wanted to make sure that it would hold the test of time. I only shared it with my wife. And after um, we decided to buy the company and knew that we were going to take a really long-term approach on this, I brought in my two business partners. I said, all right, because they, they knew that I had written these four words down. And so I, I shared it with them and they loved it. They said, yes, let's do that. I said, okay, well, we got to take our, get a, run it past our leadership team and there's like each of the four words there's sent sentiments behind each of the four words when we unpack them um, and so then the video that you're alluding to came from us interviewing our memory makers our people um, about uh, different things but we curated their responses um, and we knew what our purpose statement was but we wanted to have a big surprise launch of it and so we did this internal video through interviews we did with them about what they thought furnishing life's best memories meant to them and interacting with their guests or on the sales floor. And so then it was part of our big reveal when we brought in Inky Johnson. I don't know if you've heard of Inky Johnson to come speak at our leadership summit in uh, 2018. And so, um, and then following that, we had the launch of our purpose statement. We wanted to activate purpose. And that's what we did all through 2019 and bring and through the folks who we had um, studied and learned. We, we, um, brought in these these speakers and then what we did this year because we had to do it virtual was we democratized it because in previous years our leadership summit we can only hold so many people in the room and so this year we were able to open up to the entire company through zoom and uh and so that's so that's we just had it on friday um on the anniversary so we called it our either our anniversary event or our encore event and so we had four sessions a 9 a.m session an 11 a.m session a 1 p.m session and a 3 p.m. session, uh, and, and so it was open up for everyone in the entire organization. It was it was a virtual event, and so um, and some some really cool topics.
So I don't know if I answered your question. I just was all over the place there. No, that's, that, <laughs> that gets us into, into a lot of what the event is. And, and I noticed something that you said that I think really puts a lot of purpose behind what you, your role is. Like, number one, you outlined the career path you have and not just calling somebody a salesperson. You call them memory makers. Where did that come from? What, what's the story behind calling your people memory makers? I, I'm trying to think of how that came about exactly. Um, well, you know, Disney doesn't call their employees like employees. They call them um, cast, Imagine, cast, cast members. members. And cast Imagineers, members. right? Is that the... That's the uh, documentary they did. Imagine, yeah. Imagine, yeah, that's a cool documentary, by the way. And I know a lot about Disney just because my wife has dragged me there a few times here with <laughs> my sons um i do not like roller coasters by the way slinky dog uh, 7 a.m on a roller coaster waiting in line i know we digress um but uh we you know there's always You're having like a flashback moment there. yeah he's, well, he's, know, like, know, he's like hugging himself on camera he's sweating he's look sweating at him he's like there's himself. like drips of sweat like a going. moment that you just went back to in your mind uh, yeah, like, oh, we, we can go there if you want to go there i mean we can go there if you want to go there they, <laughs> disney does a lot of things right and they get their margins that's for dead gum sure but uh waking up to 5 a.m 4 a.m to go on on a va on a vacation to go wait in line to go on the uh what is it what is the the movie um the avatar ride oh, you, gotta, you know to wait three hours to go on a I, I get i got i got a weak stomach man and so uh uh they put a, yeah i do have flashbacks to that so anyways anything for the kids and the wife right charlie the wife and the kids anything happy wife that's right. That's right. People. That's another. That's that another episode. We'll say, so, Charlie, just lay down on this couch <laughs> and tell us all about it. Let me tell you about my first Disney trip. Oh my gosh. Um, but so, anyways, we were always trying to figure out. Well, what do we call? You know, I mean, do you call them employees, teammates, team members? Um, there's never like a great phrase that everyone can kind of adopt. So I guess through just kind of like a bunch of failures of what to call our folks. It was after we launched Furnishing Life's Best Memories. Um, we just kind of adopted, you know, being a member, be a memory maker, be a memory maker. And so we call our people memory makers, um, you know, and, and it, it forces us to have intentionality with how we treat each other and um, how we talk to each other and the language that we use. And so if you want to make a moment a memory, there has to be intention behind it. Um, you know, in uh, one of our favorite books, we, we, we have this thing called book club in our company. One of our favorite books, I'm just going to see if I have it on the wall over here uh, or behind me, is uh, Power of Moments by the Heath Brothers. It's just a phenomenal book and it goes through um, different types of uh, peak moments or flagship moments that uh, can get can, you know, etched in your memory bank as a, as a memory. And so we, we really love that when we think about furnishing life's best memories. And so um, we're memory makers. We're memory makers for our guests. I, I'm, I'm a memory maker for our people. I try to be, you know, that's part of my responsibility. Um, and, and, and for their families and we're memory makers in our communities, we try to be. Um, you know, if we're thinking about the triple bottom line and for all the stakeholders or people who are impacted by our organizational wake, um, and we're also memory makers at home with our own families. And, and so um, it's just how can we kind of, um, you know, at the end of the day, when we're all 80, 90 years old and we're looking back at uh, listening to these past pod, mattress podcasts and reflecting on uh, you know, how many millions of copies of your book that you sold um, and, and, and talking about the different copies, you know, what are we really going to have? these moments, these memories. And so you can't put a price tag on precious memories. You just can't. Like, you know, we're, we're all going to like, uh, be blessed to be hopefully uh, reasonably well taken care of in our lives and, and hopefully we, we live lives that we're proud of and we give back to the less fortunate and we, we help make the world a little bit more positive along the way. But um, what we all really want are those really special, precious memories that we, we just, uh, that's what we live for. You know, that's what we hope for are the things we get to look forward to. So when I talk about memories, it's the memories I had as a kid in the future. Like I had dreams and goals I wanted to have in the future. And then also when I, when I'm, you know, older and I look back, the, sometimes the thing that keeps me going are, are the, you know, the, is the memories I had in the, or the memories I had in the past. And so it's this perfect fusion of today where, where you have, you know, the past that supports you and the future that pulls you forward. And so in retail, we have to live for today. We have to win the day. Every single day we get a scorecard. And so I think it really pegs to our business model. Like we don't have like Netflix subscribers. Is that a little bit more topical than compact discs? <laughs> uh, so we don't have subscribers. We don't have like uh, AT&T, Verizon, or 
or uh, you know, some, you know, or or prime members yet, I guess. But but we do have the chance to interact with our people every single day. And so, if we want to be make an impact, we have to be present in the day. Give us a little bit. So I'm going to test your memory. So you mentioned the power of moments by the Heath brothers, and I love Made to Stick. That's a great book. So what are some of the key things they say about making moments or making memories? What, what are the things maybe people could put into action right now so they can be intentional when they, they are interacting with others? So they have an acronym and it's EPIC. That's how I remember it, but they don't like to use EPIC. They each even have a footnote in the book that says, but don't use EPIC. And so it's moments of elevation, peak moments, moments of um, transition. I, I, I'm going to forget them because you called me on the... Uh, off the cuff here, but it's, it's, um, uh, and they open up with a story like a uh, high school graduation or, or selecting your college and how they really, uh, looked for, you can look for moments that could otherwise just be passed or forgotten and elevate them and make them really, really special. And so like one of the things that we try to do is day one. And so we have a whole process around someone's first day because everyone remembers their first day at work. You can always remember, and that's a transition moment. And so, um, you know, we want to, we want to like, and so we have a whole surprise box, a branded box, and we're not the only ones who do it, but we try to like take it up a notch and we have people to greet them and we have a whole kind of intentionality around day one, your first day. Um, you, you know, we also have like when, when you become a million dollar memory maker or a million dollar writer, when you cross that million dollar mark, there's a whole big surprise and, and a whole big celebration for that moment, that peak moment. Um, they, they, in the book, they even give the story of the uh, Popsicle Hotline. There's this one hotel that's pretty normal, uh, but, but if you pick up the phone, you can say, hey, bring me a Popsicle, and they just bring you a Popsicle in the tray at the pool or something. Everything else about the hotel is completely normal, except for um, you know, the Popsicle, the Magic Popsicle hot, Hotline. So it's um, looking for those um, otherwise um, moments that might, that you get like a transition, like when you get promoted from one thing to another, that's a chance for a, for a, 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 a flagship or a defining moment. So just kind of the book tell, teaches you about looking for these four types of moments that you can um, make a little bit more impactful. One moment. of the things that you've mentioned a couple of times as you're talking about making, making moments, making memories, is transitions. And w during our speech at the Furniture Day Betting Conference, we had our our dose takeaways from 2020 so far. And number one was something we got from Jesse Cole, the Savannah Bananas guy, who, who also mentioned the Popsicle hotline on that episode. Hotel, and, right? He was at a hotel? Yeah. yeah. And so he says to us, you win in the transitions. And we started really thinking about not only can you win in a transition, which is COVID, mm -hmm. but you can win in the transition from the time somebody steps out of their car until they walk through your front door. You can win, like you said, with your, with your culture and with your employees and your team members and your memory makers when they transition from one position to another. Is that, do you think a lot about transitions and, and yeah. how those are so important and what you can do there? Yeah, I, I think that there's um, so much more potential there. Think about um, in, the, in our industry, right? Um, the transition, um, how much more can we make it impactful at that point of delivery? Um, you call it, call it like that zero moment of truth. Um, think about how popular unboxing videos are on YouTube, right? And how much people put into packaging. So what are we doing at the moment of delivery um, to make sure that it's super impactful? I'm just saying that's an opportunity for us and probably others. What about that moment if you find out through discovery, the person who's shopping in your store, what if it's like their very first mattress? Or what if, you, you know, that they're buying for themselves? Or what if uh, someone just gets approved for, you know, $5,000 from Synchrony Bank or, or TD Bank or whatever their financing partner is? And that's the first time they just applied for uh, a credit. Isn't that like a transition moment or a proud moment? Um, so I think that there's opportunities. We have to train ourselves. And that, there's a whole chapter in that book to, to train ourselves to look look for them and we, we went through that book as a leadership team chapter by chapter and i think that um transitions are are things that we can can really be a lot more intentional about throughout our entire business so, so charlie one of the things that i love about you uh, of many so far since we've had you on the show all of half hour however long it's been 
is that you um, you vocabulary is important to you. The thing, the words that you're using, the one word for purpose, and yet a word of the year, things like that. Um, in the furniture industry, um, they they talk about the house, but rarely do they talk about the home. And you talked about you know making memories, and the furniture store is a place where you live, but you experience life, and things happen in those rooms. And it seems like you really connect to that that idea. Why is it that the rest of the furniture industry is so much of it doesn't? Like they're selling um, headboards and footboards or dressers, and they're not selling the the idea of the emotion behind their home and what it means to buy something for their home and bring it in and how they'll feel as a result. Why do you think the furniture industry so so much misses that whole point? Um, so I, I don't, uh, that's a great question. Um, so I it would just be a purely a guess to answer your question. You know, I think that we, you know, you, you start to do something, I think as an industry, and first of all, I'm not sure that they don't, right. I'm not, may, but, but I'll, I'll, let's, let's, let's take your side that, that so many people don't, um, you know, maybe it's, it's because, um, we're living quarter to quarter. And we're trying to hit our numbers and we get, we get into this mindset of retail. Well, how'd you do? Well, the only way I know how I did is how I did versus last year. And we get so mechanical and we're just trying to uh, improve by increments, you know, how we did on, uh, did we make our numbers or not? There's so much pressure on that, that um, we're not taking enough time to get out of our four walls and think about how to disrupt ourselves or disrupt the moment or, or look at other industries um, and, and, and be challenged by, well, how would you approach this? Well, how could this be different? I don't know. We, we've got to be more willing to not be afraid of change and to disrupt ourselves and to um, think about things differently because you know, others will if we don't, you know, and, but, but I think maybe it's because um, you got, you know, companies that are feel a lot of pressure to uh, there's not a lot, you know, though people think there's a lot of margin in our, in our business, you know, there's, really not um we're all fighting for that that little margin that there's there and and, and so it's we're, we're trying to in, improve by like increments of and so sometimes you have to kind of like trust the process and and get outside your, your box and try to innovate and think about things differently but we a lot of times we get we get caught in the whirlwind we get caught in the whirlwind and in our day jobs and we don't we don't get outside to try to think about how we would blow this up completely differently. If we were starting from scratch, how might we think about it? Maybe we're not talking to enough women. Maybe it's just too male dominated. I don't know. It's a continuous did I, did I, did I, theme. Did I go there? Did I go there? Yeah, no, you, no it's, it's, great. A, it's a common theme. I mean, it's something that we've talked about on the show. It's something that came up at the Furniture Day Betting Conference, just the idea of diversity in ethnicity, gender, background in general. Um, yeah, and it's, it's pretty, pretty one-sided, it seems like, for the most part in our, our industry. And I think, you know, we've, we've talked behind the scenes about this, Quinn and I have, and I've talked with other people in the industry who are in leadership positions. And I think part of it is incumbent upon us as an industry to make it a cool place to work, to, to give people a sense of purpose behind their job. The things that you're doing and I bet you have no shortage of, of folks that want to come work for you and by the way if, if they do want to come work for you how do, how do they get in touch with your company like what's the best place to go online we have a website broadriverretail.com and we have a, a careers and a job uh, section there where um, we've got uh, some phenomenal recruiters and uh, you know we go through the whole process intentionality of the whole um, recruiting process and the interviewing process. Um, yeah, I think retail is tough, man. I think retail can, can there can be some long dog days in, in, in retail. And so if you're not keeping it fresh and um, you know, you can manage with the stick, you reference made the stick, you can manage with the stick or you can manage through purpose and impact. And, um, and, and it's gotta, people have to internalize kind of why they do what they do and, and, and feel like there's more to it than just, um, did you hit your numbers or did you not? And, and that has to be sincere and authentic. And, and, and it's got to be based off of the decisions you make day in and day out. And are they for your people or against your people? And, um, and people will ultimately 
see through, um, you know, those, those inauthenticities. And uh, I think, you know, we, we've just worked really hard to establish a lot of goodwill uh, with our people. And, and what, what I've said often to our people is at some point, in, you know, we may need to lean on that goodwill. And, 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 and so I uh, hope that we never have to, but at some point we might not, we might be in a tough pickle. And, and so, you know, this COVID thing happened and, I, you know, I'm just so blown away by how our people responded and, and really kind of fought uh, to, to kind of dig us out of here and and um uh and we put a, together a lot of programs um you know we put together a memory maker assistance fund uh, before we even knew about the stimulus checks uh we were sending out checks to our folks who we had to put on furlough um we we um you know in the industry i heard some folks uh and i'm not gonna name any names who were saying hey times are gonna get tight this is a perfect time to prune and um and we said yeah prune your bottom 10 percent the old jack welch mentality i said no, like we had zero layoffs, by the way. We, we, and by the way, we had uh, no government uh, assistance. We didn't qualify for the um, um, PPP uh, um, uh, loan. So, um, and I'm happy for those who did, and I hope that all the, those loans get forgiven, but, but we didn't, and, and we didn't lay off any of our people, and we created a fund in partnership with uh, my former business partner, Jonathan Ishi. We borrowed from our founder scholarship fund, which goes back to provide scholarships for uh, the children of our memory makers. And, and we borrowed from that funds plus new additional funds. And, and, we, um, and we, we sent out stimulus checks to our own people, uh, everyone who was on furlough or who had a financial impact. Um, and so we've done things like that. We've done interest-free loans. Uh, we've done top-off programs. So I just think you gotta be willing, you know, I, I really, um, there's a book called Everybody Matters by Bob Chapman, which is, uh, you know, really influential in, in terms of kind of how we try to manage and lead. And, um, and so you got to make it fun. You can gamify it. You can have contests. Um, you can't be afraid to throw out some massive jackpot bonuses. That's an old Tony Robbins trick. So we, uh, we you know, we, we, we love huge, handsome rewards and we like to see our people make just incredible amounts of money. And it's, that's all about mutual prosperity and, and believing um, that uh, a spirit of abundance as opposed to a spirit of scarcity and believing that it's not a zero sum game, that there's enough to go around. And so if the company wins, we want um, uh, our, our leaders to win. We want our people to win. We want even our vendors to win. We're not afraid for our vendors to win. And, and that's because we're, we're, we, we, and, and the, uh, community, the the climate, the planet. We're we're concerned about the whole ecosystem. We think that's a a, a more sustainable approach to um, uh, 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 you know capitalism. And and so I'm also inspired by you know the cap uh, conscious capitalism movement. There's a book called Donut Economics, something about that. You know, about uh, regenerative regenerative. I can't say this word. You'll have to help me out. Regenerative. That's it. I don't think I did. Regenerative. Can you speak yeah, like a doc? He's I have have... Yeah. So there's, there's, um, but, but, you know, like what kind of world do we want our kids to grow up in? And, and is it where mm -hmm. there's just a few winners and, and, and everyone else gets scraps or where we all kind of, uh, right. You know, everyone does well together. So that's just some of the things that have influenced our thinking. Well, I have one question for you as we wrap up today. Vanderhall or Polaris slingshot? Are you gonna take your mom's advice? <laughs> um, I love this question. I yeah. um, I think I've gone to Quinn's side here. I like the Batman uh, uh, mobile look. So um, I love what Vanderhall is doing, uh, but that slingshot looks slick, man. The slingshot looks slick. I think it's I think it's the slingshot. But you know what? Truth be told, I need to go try them both out. I need to go take a comfort test in each of them and, uh, and, and, and really make an informed decision. I, I, I mentioned the duck because you're, we were trying to get you to pronounce a word and on the Furniture Today betting conference, Kinsley forced me into speaking like Donald Duck, which is appropriate for this since we've been talking. Who the hell can do that? I could barely do that. But anyway, so that was, I was waiting for him to like force you into that. As a, no, please so don't. I, as, as we do wrap up, I want to bring up one last thing too. Uh, you, you talked about your um, purpose 828 and you said it was from Romans. While you were talking, I looked this up. I just want to read this and it says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, 
who have been called according to his purpose. And so I, I love that because it is a reality that there will be valleys and there will be peaks. And you have to have a faith in what you're doing and in your people and, and all of those things. And the good and the bad all play together for the greater good. You just have to believe that that's true. And you guys clearly do believe that. That's well said. I couldn't say any better. We do. Yeah, we, we um, look, I, I'll just, um, I guess as we wrap up here, I'll just close with saying this. Um, I think that uh, this, this, this time has been tough for a lot of people in a lot of different ways. And anything that we can do to try to ease the pain for our people, um, I just think it's the right thing to do. I, I mean, in some way, I also think it will, that'll pay off for us down the road in some way, some shape or how. But I, I think mental health is real. I think, um, I think uh, you know, the anxiety that comes about, I, I think that social distancing is not the most accurate phrase. I think it should be physical distancing. Um, because that's really literally you're trying to stay six feet apart and, 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 and wear a mask and be safe. But like we need to be, we need to over index on social connection because the risk of not being socially connected is isolation. And I think that takes us to um, a, 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 a bad uh, a place that's not super healthy. And so um, I just know that this has been a tough period of time for a lot of people. I'm really ready, just like everyone else for a vaccine to, to be out there, for us to be past this. And I just encourage everyone to hang on, we'll get through this. Um, there will be peaks and valleys. And, uh, but one way we can get through it is how we treat each other. And hopefully uh, kindness can, can emerge as one of the, our principles that um, we hang on to on the other side of this. And um, you know, I know we're in a, you know, a crazy election season, but, but ultimately um, I think that we, we, we've got to figure out how we treat each other. And, um, and you know, there's great companies that you guys have interviewed on this podcast and uh, I, I support them all. I, I, love, I love retail, I love the industry and, um, and uh, wish you guys all the best, man. I, I hope to order hundreds of copies of that book when it comes out and we're going to give them out to our, our memory makers. It just if you're going to guess the, the title of the book, what would you guess the title of the book might be? Because Quinn, Quinn keeps telling me, he's like, I'm worried I'm going to be the one that slips up and lets it out of the bag first. Yeah. How many, how many words? How many words is it? Uh, should we give him that? Wait, wait. It's just, this is perfect for you because he's a word guy. It's four words and you're the guy that has four words that kind of define that retail environment. Um, so... Um, you're putting him on the spot. I love it. That's so out, great. Not, not, and, and here's the thing. Whenever, no. whenever you tell us, <laughs> it has to, you have to talk like a duck as you tell us. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. no it's way. yes and. No Never way. say yes, no to me. Yes and or a mouse. You can talk like a mouse if you want to talk. Wait, what did you say? I think we talked over you. What, um, is the word mattress in the title? We can't tell you that. Eh? Well, I think it's going to be something about... Um, the 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 driving retail foot traffic but that's way too literal you guys are way too creative for that um, <laughs> um it's got the word dose in it it's uh it's so it's dos so it's definitely got dose um it's maybe it's dose marco so maybe that's two of the four words uh i like where you're going i do too because I, we should have had him name the book with us yeah if we do another book in the future we're just gonna have you come be a part of the brainstorm for the um, title well, I mean, uh, or, or it's by those markers maybe maybe it's by the, maybe that's in the byline um you, you mentioned the, i think we should call it double dose of marks oh, just like totally that's good it's kind of meta in a way <laughs> Tell you what, Charlie, you do not have to answer right now. You can send us a note and text us what you think the book should be called, and we'll we'll throw it in the in the pile. And hey, I want to I want to say something before we close out. Like, you're an inspirational guy. No I doubt. love this conversation, and yeah. I know that we're talking to you. And there are so many people that are part of the team, memory makers, and and everybody that touches every piece of the product goes out the door. Delivery teams. Uh, I love this industry and I love seeing companies do it right. And we love shining a big bat signal spotlight mm -hmm. on the people that are doing it right. Even if they don't have their pl player slingshot yet. <laughs> and so we've, we've really enjoyed this. And to your people, if they listen to this, um, 
we get to see some really incredible companies and we get to see some that are on their way up and trying to make their way. And you guys are way, way up at the top on our list. Thank you so much. That's very kind. And, and you're exactly right. We have, um, it, it's all of our people. We, we're, we're blessed with some incredible people that I get to work shoulder to shoulder with every single day. And um, so I'll, I'll, maybe I'll ask them what they think the name of the, your book is going to be. Um, uh, how, how to eat a mattress one, one bite at a time. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Hey, Charlie, you, you have inspired us. We're really grateful for you taking the time with us. And um, I think you were right on to something. I, I hope the people in your company um, realize how lucky they are to be part of that because there's not a lot of companies um, that get it the way you do. So keep on keeping on, keep shining that light. And uh, we hope you'll come back and talk with us some more. I, I've enjoyed it immensely. And I sure will anytime. Thanks so much, guys.